Hi there. Back in my bedroom because it's really cold today. Um, there's Josie in her little bed back there. Hi, Josie. She's sleeping. Today's chapter is the summer of 1930, and it's called The Mouse in the Milk. We shall see. <clears throat> From something Dad said, it had dawned on Mary Alice and me that our trip down to Grandma's was meant to be an annual event. Mary Alice pitched a fit. It meant another week of summer vacation away from her friends, Beverly and Audrey. Besides, she said she wasn't over last year's visit yet. One night, she'd have a nightmare about old shotgun Cheatham sitting up in his coffin and on the night after that, she'd dream that Grandma's big old tomcat was jumping at her, or so she said. But having no choice, we went. If any of us had grown over the year, it was Grandma herself, and she still seemed to prize her privacy as much as ever. She mostly stayed home because she said the whole town was a slum, and she didn't give two hoots about it and she wouldn't even have a radio in her house. Mary Alice brought her jump rope to keep herself occupied, though she said jumping rope by yourself was the loneliest job in the world. I took a giant jigsaw puzzle to put together. It was supposed to depict Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh and his airplane, The Spirit of St. Louis. There wasn't room for it in our Chicago apartment. But in the summers, Grandma took down the stove that heated up her front room, so there was space to leave a card table up. One night, soon after we arrived, I was working on the puzzle, and Grandma was drowsing in her platform rocker. I guess that's just some type of rocking chair. She said she never slept, but she had to wake herself up to go to bed. Earlier, before it got dark, Mary Alice had been jumping rope outside. There weren't a lot of sidewalks in Grandma's town, but a strip of concrete ran from her front door out to the countrified mailbox beside the road. Grandma and I had been listening to Mary Alice. Jump said Coolidge, jump said Hoover, jump said the driver of the furniture mover. And Mary Alice's personal favorite, I had a letter from Nellie, and what do you think it said? Nellie had a baby, and its hair was red. Now, how many hairs were on that head? One, two, three, and then you count how many times you can jump rope. When she got up to 180, Grandma called her inside. So now, Mary Alice was sulking somewhere. Grandma's breathing was steady, the way it got before she started snoring. Then I heard a horse clopping past. That was no rare thing around here, but I noticed the silence when the horse stopped outside. Then right away, heels kicked at its sides and the horse galloped off. It was a sound right out of a Tom Mix movie. I was reaching for a puzzle part that was just blue sky when a flash of light filled the bay window. Then an explosion shook the house and made my puzzle jump. It wasn't as loud as the time Grandma squeezed off two rounds right here in the front room, but it brought her out of her chair. Like a ship under sail, she made for the front door. Mary Alice appeared from somewhere and we both looked around Grandma into the night. You could barely see a stump out by the road. It was the post that had held the mailbox. But the mailbox was gone in several directions. We heard a piece of metal slide down the shingles of the roof, bounce off the gutter, and fall through the snowball bushes. Somebody on horseback had blown Grandma's mailbox sky high. The 4th of July was over, but there were still plenty of loose fireworks around. And this was no small charge, not a baby waker or even a torpedo. This could only have been the work of a cherry bomb.
Grandma planted her big fists on her big hips and her jaw clenched in a familiar way. Cowgills, she said. Like that explained it. Grandma slept in a room downstairs to save herself the stairs. Mary Alice and I had rooms upstairs. They were sparsely furnished <clears throat> with iron bedsteads and a lot of dead bugs on the sills. After I got used to how quiet the country was at night, I slept good up there. But I lay awake that night, recalling the sound when Grandma's mailbox was blown to smithereens. I was 10, the age when things blowing up interested me. But I wondered who dare do this to Grandma. My eyelids drooped and it was morning. The smell of breakfast wafted up from the kitchen. You had to be downstairs on time and in your place, but grandma's breakfasts were worth it. Pancakes and corn syrup, fried ham and potatoes and onions, anything you wanted and as much. Mary Alice and I were at the table and grandma was at the stove turning one last round of pancakes when we got a visitor on the back porch. We all looked. The screen on the door blurred her, but it was grandma's old enemy, Mrs. Effie Wilcox. <laughs> she didn't make free to rap on the door. She just stood out on the porch in a faded apron and broken boots, working her hands. Mrs. Dowdell, holy, she called out in a tragic voice. Grandma strolled over to the door. What now, she said through the screen wire. Mrs. Wilcox moaned. Oh, first of all, can I use it? She nodded down the back path to the cob house and the privy, and she didn't mean the cob house. Feel free, Grandma said, take a pew. But Mrs. Wilcox just stood there on the porch wringing her hands. I'm so nervous. I don't know if... What's come over you? Grandma said in her least interested voice. Mrs. Wilcox whimpered. Send them kids out of your kitchen so I can tell you. They're having their breakfast, Grandma said. And they're from Chicago, so they've heard everything. Well, it was last night, Mrs. Wilcox said. They come on my place and wrenched up my you-know-what by the posts, flung it all over the yard. They knocked your privy over three months ahead of Halloween? Grandma was interested at last. What's the world coming to? So somebody, first somebody blew up Grandma's mailbox, but then it sounds like probably the same people knocked over Mrs. Wilcox's privy. That's her outhouse, remember? Her bathroom. So she's come over to Grandma's because she needs to go potty. She's asking to use Grandma's privy, but she's a little nervous to go out there since hers has been knocked over. That's what I said, Mrs. Wilcox replied. I'm too nervous to live. All the laws of civilization has broke down and town life is getting too dangerous. My only consolation is that there's a prayer meeting at church tomorrow night and I got me some praying to do. Do that, Grandma said. But Mrs. Wilcox couldn't wait another minute. She darted off the porch and down the path to our privy. Grandma settled into her chair to smother her last pancake with corn syrup. Then once again, she said, Cowgills. Presently, Mary Alice slipped down from her chair and headed outside. When she got to the screen door, Grandma said, I wouldn't use the privy all morning if I was you. I think she's insinuating that Effie Wilcox may have left a bit of it in the privy. That next morning when I came into the kitchen, a sight stopped me dead in the door. Behind me, Mary Alice pulled up short too. Next to a box of shells, Grandpa Dowdell's old double-barreled Winchester Model 21 
was on the kitchen table along with a greasy rag like grandma meant to clean it. So when it says a box of shells, they're not talking about seashells. That's what they would call the um, bullet casings that you would fire out of a Winchester rifle. <clears throat> Just the sight of that gun made my ears ring. Then I saw somebody besides Grandma was in the kitchen over by the door. He was a big, tall galoot of a kid with narrow eyes. His gaze kept flitting to the shotgun. The uniform he had on was all white with a cap to match. In his hand was a wire holder for milk bottles. He was ready to make his escape, but Grandma was saying, I hope I have better luck with your milk today than the last batch. I found a dead mouse in your delivery yesterday. The kid's narrow eyes widened. No, you never, he said. Be real careful about calling a customer a liar, she remarked. I had to feed that milk to the cat. And the mouse, too, of course. No, the kid said reaching around for the knob on the screen door behind him. Grandma was telling one of her whoppers. If she'd found a mouse in the milk, she'd have exploded like the mailbox. She was telling a whopper, and I wondered why. And another thing, she said. I won't be needing a delivery tomorrow, neither milk nor cream. I'm going away. First we'd heard of it. Mary Alice nudged me hard. I'll be gone tonight and all day tomorrow, and I don't want the milk left out where it'll sour. I won't pay for it. I'm taking my grandkids on a visit to my cousin, Leota Shrewsbury. Another whopper, and a huge one. In case you hadn't noticed, a whopper is a lie. Grandma, off on a jaunt and us with her? I didn't think so. She didn't do things that cost, and she never told anybody her business. Turning from the stove, she pretended surprise at seeing Mary Alice and me there, though she had eyes in the back of her head. Why, there's my grandkids now, she pointed us out with a spatula. They're from Chicago. Gangs run that town, you know, she told the kid. My grandson's in a gang, so you don't want to mess with him. He's meaner than he looks. <laughs> I hung in the doorway, bug-eyed and short. She was saying I, Joey Dowdell, was a tough guy from Chicago, and this kid was twice my size. He could eat me for lunch. This here's Ernie Cowgill, she said, finishing off the introductions with a sneer at me. Ernie Cowgill disappeared through the door and stomped off the porch. Grandma, I croaked, you'll get me killed. She waved that away. I just said that for your protection. He'll be scared of you now. He'd believe anything. He's only in fourth grade. Grandma, he's at least 16. That's right, and still in fourth grade, she said. He's the runt of the cowgill litter. He's got three older brothers and they're big bruisers. They're the ones you wouldn't want to meet up with in a dark alley. She swept shotgun shells and the greasy rag off the kitchen table and put them all back behind the wood box. Then she nodded at Mary Alice to set the table for breakfast. When we sat down to eat, I said, Grandma, what was the shotgun for? Bait, she said. Who's cousin Leota Shrewsbury? Mary Alice asked. Who? Grandma said. I lurked pretty near home all day. I didn't even go uptown to the coffee pot cafe for fear I'd run into Ernie Cowgill and his brothers. Now I remembered where I'd heard the name. The horse-drawn milk wagon that delivered to the door had a sign on its side that read, Cowgill's Dairy Farm, from our clover-fed cows to your kitchen. Strictly sanitary, 
farm fresh eggs our specialty. So back in those olden days, you'd have to get your milk and eggs and stuff delivered straight from, the, from a dairy farm. So these are the, t the dairy farmers to the town. In fact, I'd seen Ernie drive it standing up, handling the reins through a hole in the front window of the wagon. Even at a distance, he looked like somebody you wouldn't want to know better. It may have been just a coincidence that a family named Cowgill ran the dairy. I never knew. Noticing how close to home I was keeping, Grandma told me to weed the garden. You didn't want to hang around her too close or she'd give you a job. The garden ran neat and tidy from the back porch down to the cob house beside the yard where she stretched her clothesline. I weeded through the heat of the day and every time I got down by the cob house, I had a vision of all four Cowgill brothers stepping out of it. I could picture them hanging me from the eaves by my belt and taking turns slapping me to sleep. But I saw nothing but the crossed paws of the old tomcat napping just inside the door. The two rows of green onions made my eyes water and the smell was making me woozy. I was thinking seriously of heat stroke when I heard Mary Alice shriek in the kitchen. She was no screamer, so it brought me to my feet. Now I thought Ernie Cowgill had gotten in and pounced on her. I jumped the garden rows, pounding for the house. But it was only Grandma and Mary Alice in the kitchen. Mary Alice's eyes were big as quarters, like orphan Annie's, and she had both hands clapped over her mouth. Grandma towered over the table. Held high in her hand was a mouse trap with the mouse still in it. A good sized mouse. Its tail dangled down so far it looked like one of the flypaper strips that hung from her kitchen ceiling. The spring on the trap had caught the mouse at the neck and nearly pulled his head loose. He was hanging by a thread and not a pretty sight. Mary Alice had already gone into shock. This was one more of those experiences she says gave her nightmares for years. Grandma examined her catch. Now she moved the trap into position over the mouth of an empty bottle. She eased up the spring and the mouse dropped straight in. He hit the bottom of the bottle with a soft thump. She turned back to the drain board and picked up another bottle full of milk, fresh, I suppose, from Ernie Cowgill's morning delivery. Without spilling a drop, she poured milk into the bottle on the table. Mary Alice and I watched like two paralyzed people as the milk rose around the mouse's furry gray body until his whiskers began to float. As the milk closed over his head, Mary Alice bolted. If the back door had been latched, she'd have gone straight through the screen wire. Now Grandma was fitting a paper lid over the milk and mouse bottle. I knew not to ask why she was doing this. I didn't even want to know. Mary Alice didn't come back in the house till supper time. Then she didn't want any supper. I watched her move green beans and fat back around the plate with the big fork in her small hand. Grandma ate hearty. After a big wedge of layer cake, she pulled back from the table. Let's step right along and get them dishes washed and dried and put up, she said. She was in a hurry and I couldn't see why, but then I couldn't see a moment ahead. There was still some evening left, but the light was fading. Grandma stayed in the kitchen after we'd wandered into the front room. But as Mary Alice was reaching for her jump rope to take outside, Grandma turned up and said, not tonight. Mary Alice glowered but said nothing. She flopped on the settee and fidgeted. Settee is fancy for couch. Then she started to go upstairs. She brought a book called the Hidden Staircase by Carolyn Keene, 
and she liked reading in bed. Not tonight, Grandma said. She sat at her ease in the platform rocker with her sewing basket at her feet. She didn't do much fancy needlework, but she mended everything. Mary Alice came over to lean against me while I worked on Colonel Lindbergh. When it got so dark I couldn't see the puzzle, I reached to turn on the lamp, but Grandma said, not tonight. By then, we had to know we were in for something. Shut the front door, Grandma told Mary Alice, who was just a little gray shape, mouse-like, as she went over to close it. Shoot the bolt across, said Grandma, who never locked her doors. Now we three were only outlines in the dark parlor. Some plot was afoot. Mary Alice edged back on the settee. We were all waiting for something. It was dark now. I could picture what the house looked like from outside. Locked up, not a light showing upstairs or down. All of us gone away to visit cousin Leota Shrewsbury, who didn't exist. Half an hour passed. Then Grandma spoke, making us leap. We could tell ghost stories, she said. Not tonight, Mary Alice said in a small voice. Later, much later, we heard something. The snowball bushes outside the window swayed gently. I barely saw Grandma's hand come up to stroke her cheek. We didn't breathe for listening. Then footsteps on the back porch, creeping, then more confident. After all, nobody was home. A hand closed over the knob on the screen door to the kitchen and found it latched. We heard a little sawing, singing sound as a file began to slice through the screen wire. From the settee, Mary Alice made some tiny, terrified sound. Grandma reached down for something in her sewing basket. The darkness made me see pinwheels like sparklers. I just managed to notice Grandma's rocker was rocking and she wasn't in it. She was standing over me. Keep just behind me, she whispered. I followed her across the room to the kitchen. You wouldn't believe a woman that heavy could be so light on her feet. She floated, and we moved like some strange beast, big in front, small behind. Now we were by the door to the kitchen, and I heard the scuffle of heavy feet in there on the crinkly linoleum. Grandma turned back to me. Under my nose, she struck a wooden match with her thumbnail. Men strike a match one-handed, but you never see a woman doing that. She hid that flare of the flame with herself and touched the match to something in the other hand. It sizzled. Then she leaned down and rolled it into the invisible kitchen. Seconds passed. Then once more, Grandma's house erupted in sound and light. Blue lightning flashed in the kitchen, and for a split second, you could see every calendar on the wall in there. Then an almighty explosion like the crack of doom. She'd rolled a cherry bomb across the floor, and it went off right under the eight feet of the Cowgill brothers, the three big bruisers, and Ernie. Grandma shoved me past her into the kitchen. Pull the chain on the ceiling light, she said, and I did. When I turned back to her, Grandpa Dowdell's shotgun was wedged into her shoulder. I dodged out of her way, and there stood all four Cowgill brothers. They were deaf as posts and too scared to move, even before they realized they were looking down both barrels of the gun they'd come to steal. All of them wore manure-caked steel-toed boots, 
so that had saved their toes from being blown off, but a singed smell came from their pants. The cherry bomb had scared them wit witless, except for Ernie, who was witless anyway. But he was the only one who could speak. I'm dead, he said. I'm dead. Oh, yes, I'm dead. Skin to the church and get their mind pa, Grandma said briefly to me. Which church? Holy rollers, she said, by the lumber yard. And step on it, I've got an itchy Traeger finger. I'm dead, Ernie said. I raced like the wind through the nighttime town. I sprinted past the business block and across the tracks by the depot toward the lumber yard. Then I began to hear singing with a ragtime beat accompanied by tambourines. The church was no bigger than a one-room schoolhouse, but it seemed to be packed to the rafters. The rail outside was thick with horses hitched to wagons. One of the wagons was from Cowgill's Dairy Farm. Light and song were pouring out of the open doorway. I stood in it, remembering I didn't know what the Cowgill's Ma and Pa looked like. Besides, all I could see were the backs of people's heads. Then I got lucky. Mrs. Effie Wilcox sat at the end of a pew. I knew her from her hat. Her hands were high above her head, swaying in the air, and she was singing with the rest. I sidled down the side aisle, breathing heavy. Every minute counted, and I didn't know how long this hymn might last. It sounded like it could have a lot of verses. I tapped Mrs. Wilcox on the shoulder. She jerked around. It's a miracle, she hollered out. The first Dowdell ever seen in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah, one more sinner gathered in. Listen, Mrs. Wilcox, I said, urgent in her ear. Where are the cowgills? It's kind of important. The cowgills, she said. Why, they're right here next to me. Where else would they be? They've been saved, and now you. Listen, Mrs. Wilcox, Grandma blew up all four of their boys with a cherry bomb. Now she's got them pinned down with the shotgun. Mrs. Wilcox's mouth opened in a silent scream. Then all four of us, Mr. and Mrs. Cowgill, Mrs. Wilcox and me, were in the swaying milk wagon behind the galloping horse. There aren't any seats in a milk wagon, so we clung to the sides and each other. For somebody too nervous to live, Mrs. Wilcox stood the trip pretty well. The wagon bounced across Grandma's side yard. Now we were all tumbling down and racing each other to the back door. To keep up, both ladies held their skirts up high. We burst into the kitchen and it seemed that nobody had moved a muscle in there. The butt of the shotgun was still buried in Grandma's shoulder and she was squinting down the barrels. The Cowgill boys looked like they were on the chain gang already. Chain gang is like when people are in jail and they take them out to work on the side of the highway and everybody's chained together so nobody can escape. They call that the chain gang. I got my first real look at their ma and pa. She was kind of a faded lady, and he had a milder look than his bruiser boys. They were all a lot taller than he was. Now, now, Mr. Cowgill said, what have we here? What we have here, Grandma said, is breaking and entering, burglary and pilfering. Reform school for the youngest one and the penitentiary for the overgrown ones. Unless my trigger finger gives way to temptation, they wanted this shotgun and they're liable to get it right between their eyes. The ceiling light glinted wickedly off her spectacles. And they tore down Effie Wilcox's specialty house. Tell it, Effie. You knew at the time who the culprits was who kicked your privy to kingdom come. Mrs. Wilcox whimpered. Mm. Now, now, Mrs. Dowdell, Mr. Cowgill said. This is nothing more than a misunderstanding. My boys aren't broke out with brains, you know. I have an idea they just wandered into the wrong house. 
Oh, they wandered into the wrong house, all right, Grandma said, and they'd already blowed up the wrong mailbox. Mrs. Dowdell, Mrs. Dowdell, compose your soul in patience, Mr. Cowgill said, and put up that shotgun. It don't look ladylike. I was tempted to cover my ears because that alone was enough to make Grandma squeeze off around. You know yourself, Mrs. Dowdell. Boys will be boys. They's high-spirited. They'll settle down in time and all be good Christian men. Their Ma and I have set them a good example. I thought Mr. Cowgill was going way out on a limb, but strangely... Grandma lowered the shotgun. Well, you know best, being their pa, she said calmly. She stood the shotgun against the wall and folded her arms before her. But get them out of my kitchen, and you owe me for the screen wire they cut to get in. And I'll want me a new mailbox, a good galvanized iron one, even if it runs you three dollars. Mr. Cowgill paled at that, but said, There now, I knew you'd see sense, Mrs. Dowdell. Boys go through these phases. Come along, boys. He patted his biggest bruiser's shoulder, and all four of them were trying hard not to smirk. Mrs. Cowgill left first, supported by Mrs. Wilcox. Then the bruisers and Ernie trooped out. Their paw was just at the door when Grandma said, Not so fast, Cowgill. He turned back, unwilling. I'll be interested in your explanation for that. She pointed to the milk bottle that nobody had noticed, though it stood on the kitchen table. The milk in it was more pink than white now, but you could see the mouse inside. In fact, it had swelled up some. What the, you can say that again, Grandma remarked. Sweat popped out on Mr. Cowgill's brow. Mrs. Dowdell, you don't mean to tell me. I don't mean to tell you a thing. There stands the evidence. Mrs. Dowdell, it can't be. We're strictly sanitary. We strain our milk. Sweat ran in rivers off his pate. I don't doubt it, she said. After all, you've got to keep your good name in a town like this. Then how? A bunch of worthless boys who'd ransack the town every night is apt to drop a mouse in the milk just before delivering to my door. Your big ones is perfectly capable of putting Ernie up to it. He's simple. After all, they blew up my mailbox. And Effie Wilcox has to use my privy. Thugs like yours who prey on two old helpless widow women such as Effie and myself is liable to get up to anything. Many more mice in the milk and your customers will start keeping their own cows again. Mr. Cowgill shrank. His dry mouth worked wordlessly and there was fear in his eyes naked fear. He didn't mind what his boys did to the town, but now he saw his business going down the drain, so to speak. Mrs. Dowdell, he said in a broken voice, what do you want? Justice, Grandma said. A pause fell upon them. Grandma and Mr. Cowgill seemed to have a moment of complete understanding. Then he said, what'll I use? She nodded across the kitchen to the sink. In his earthly life, Grandpa Dowdell had shaved over that sink. The mirror still hung there from his time and beside it a long leather strop for sharpening the edge on his cutthroat razor. Mr. Cowgill edged around the kitchen table and pulled the strop off the wall like a long strip of leather. Then he left. Grandma and I filled the doorway to watch. It was dark out there, but you could see the lumpish shapes of the cowgill boys hanging around their milk wagon, 
waiting for their pa. They didn't have to wait a minute more. Line up according to age, he called out, snapping the long leather strop above his head. Then he wailed the tar out of every one of them. They squealed like stuck hogs while Mrs. Cowgill lamented from the wagon. He took each by the arm in turn and gave them all what for. You could tell when he got Ernie because a wavering voice cried out, I'm dead. At last, the milk wagon clattered out of the yard. Grandma stayed at the door as peace descended. The snap of the strop against bruiser britches seemed to linger in the night air. Mary Alice joined us. She'd made herself scarce once she'd seen Grandma grab up the shotgun. She was a little older now, a little wiser. Then back up the path came Mrs. Wilcox. You could see the shape of her hat bobbing against the dark. She'd been making a call at our privy on her way home. Night now, she called out across in the yard. Night, Effie. Grandma called back to her worst enemy. Then she turned from the door, and I saw the look on her face. You had to study hard to see any expression at all, but it was a look I was coming to know. She appeared pretty satisfied at the way things had turned out, and she'd returned law and order to the town she claimed she didn't give two hoots about.